Hey guys, Steven here, Fanatic Perspective. It's time to get into the details on Texas and Kansas. Guys, remember, we got a W. We're five and two. The sky isn't completely falling. There's a lot we got to discuss today. We're going to jump into everything. But first, want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Boss's Ranch, outstanding product, your local HEB and the cold produce section. Guys, I've been loving this product. Many of you have provided great feedback. Those of you tailgating, you know, those of you trying to get a little bit healthier with your salads, what have you. It's a great fresh product, uh, something that I'm excited to partner up. Again, fellow UT fans, so if you want to support somebody in the Texas community, you want to support somebody who has an award-winning product, highly renowned, all over social media, check out Boss's Ranch, your local HEB, and the cold produce section. Very, very excited to continue to be partnered up with those guys. And while we're giving shout-outs, I would also like to give a shout-out to Horns Illustrated, 25th anniversary edition. It's not too late to get your copy. And to subscribe below to the Horns Illustrated website, getting all news uh, on all the UT sports. A lot of people having some tremendous seasons, the men's and women's programs. So go to Horns Illustrated for up-to-date coverage. So Texas, Kansas. Um, if you went across social media, you would have think we lost the game. Uh, you would have thought, you know, somebody passed away. And uh, your boy was one of those people in the stands. Some of y'all saw my face, whether it was on the Jumbotron, maybe not looking the most excited at the end of the game when Kansas took the lead after Les decided to go for the two-point conversion. So, you know, I want to get into all those things. I have a lot of uh, notes after going back and, and not just watching this game, but charting this football game and, and seeing – where, what, what can we learn from this? What can we take away, stepping away as rational football fans, as rational people who can can look at this team and evaluate certain things as Tom Herman and this staff had to do, you know, coming off of Saturday, yesterday, Sunday, that, you know, saying, hey, I had a great practice, but how do we evaluate this fairly without just going to overreaction, typical social media reaction where it's fire everyone, you know, after they have a bad performance, let's bench this guy, let's fire this coach. What do we need to do and, and, and where do we begin, right? So there were some good things that I noticed on film. There were some good positive things. Yes, we have a two-point victory over an opponent, opponent like Kansas, who's now two and five, but the you know many of us are talking about the the injuries and making excuses the coach brought it up today at the press conference about the injuries and those of you who have followed this channel for a long time know that i'm not in the excuse business we we do audit things and we hold people accountable but in my mind sometimes there's a difference between a reason and an excuse Sometimes there's reasons why something happened, whether it's an excuse or whatever. And then sometimes there's something that's just flat out an excuse. You're using that as a crutch to hold yourself from the true, you know, truly being accountable for, for the actions that took place. So coming into this game, these are just the facts. They came in, they had nine, you know, freshmen and sophomores in the defensive rotation to, to, to start this football game. Malcolm Roach, who was suspended for the first half because of the targeting penalty that he, you know, had in the Oklahoma game. Juwan Mitchell was very questionable because of the sprained elbow. Guys, when you're out there playing Byron Bonds and you're in the fourth quarter with a Mason Ramirez who just got a scholarship, God bless him. You start the game with David Benda, who's never played before. I mentioned Byron Bonds before, who's never played before you're going to be in a very compromised position no matter who the opponent is when you're factoring in the lack of reps and the lack of opportunities these guys have had to play. Everybody deals with injuries. That is true. Everybody has guys that are out. No one's at this point in the season, game seven, no one's going to be fully, you know, upright as a whole team, the whole roster, everybody's healthy, right? But this is an unprecedented situation like I've never seen in terms of the linebackers in the secondary. I will get to the defensive line because they are not off the hook. But when you're looking at this linebacking court, 
Todd Orlando, who many people who is under fire right now, and you're seeing the stats about this being the worst Texas defense in school history and the yards they're giving up and all the struggles they're having. We knew what it was with the corner situation coming into the season. All those things considered. You tell me what he's supposed to do when he runs out of bodies. He's lit, he, lit, he has literally run out of bodies, especially with the linebacker situation. All right. Now, I want to start with Joseph Osai because we're essentially asking him to be a Superman, right? And many of us have talked about, okay, one of the solutions we want to have is maybe moving to more of a four-man look or four-man line. Maybe that'll help with some of the outside contain issues we've been having. Todd Orlando made that adjustment. He did a lot of those things. I'm actually going to go big picture here right now, if y'all don't mind. We, we talked about getting off to the slow starts and not, you know, and playing from behind. We actually got up 14-0. Offense took the ball, went right down and scored. We actually, now granted Kansas on their initial drive did go down the field and miss a field goal, but we actually didn't give up points for for the first time in a while on our first drive. So all these things we wanted to see, at least to start, to switch things up, we come out, we show the four-man look, we do all these things, and yet the results still seem to be the same on defense. And worse, when you're considering the people that you're now losing throughout this football game. Brandon Jones gets hurt. Joseph Osai gets hurt. B.J. Foster, I'll get to him in a second as well. It's just, it's 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 a terrible, terrible situation that you're dealing with. And I don't think it's fair for us as fans to point at somebody and say they should be fired. It, it'd be totally different situation. I know Lincoln Riley decided to fire Mark Stoops last year after the horrendous performance that his defense allowed in the Texas OU game the first time we played. But circumstances being, he had all his guys available, and they were still terrible. One thing I do know is before the Oklahoma game, when we had some more bodies, we were only allowing 3.4 yards of carry against the run. Those run numbers since the OU game have gone through the roof. I recognize that. This team, though, has not always been bad with stopping the run. Now they've been bad with stopping quarterback run and 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 Carter Stanley got off and and you know Spencer Sanders got off and Jalen Hurts got off and we'll get to Max Duggan slash Alex Delton and, and the rest of the guys we have to face. That's an issue. But in terms of containing the run, before the Oklahoma game last week, we had been solid at that. That had been one of the strengths of our defense. So when you talk and then and then when you're looking at the amount of bodies you're losing, and why am I harping on this so much? Because at some point, I got to play football with at least some of my guys. All right? Like, it's it's one thing to ask second-string guys because you hear about teams saying, hey, we go too deep at this position. We, go too, we are even three deep at this position. We're at the point now when I mean, you're asking guys that are walk-ons or somebody to make their first start after not playing – on top of also being responsible for all special teams units, which Byron Vons was already a special teamer, and he was at some point even behind Marcus Tillman Jr., who's out for the season. I mean, you just go through the list of names. It's insane uh, across the board of what this Longhorn team is having to deal with. Unfortunately, I'm going to bring up another name right now, Caleb Johnson. It's a guy that decided to put his name in the transfer portal. I believe he's now transferred to UCLA. That's a guy who would have played a lot of snaps for us on Saturday night, right? So, you know, that's that's what we're dealing with. You have another guy. We, we brought in the Gabriel Floyd, David Benda, uh, Marcus Tillman Jr., Jawan Mitchell. Who else? Uh, I think that was like – I think we brought in like four linebackers last year, four or five linebackers. And excuse me if I miss anybody. And, and look at that. That's just on top of – Losing Jeffrey McCulloch, who's out with the shoulder problem. I mean, it's 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 insane when you're looking at that group. And then you you have three more starters: no Jalen Green, no Josh Thompson, no Caden Stars. Who are we even playing football with at this point? <laughs> and then we're trying to tackle one of the most dynamic runners in the Big Twelve, and Puka Williams Jr., who was sensational on Saturday. So. Look, we have to factor those things in. I'm not saying that the coaches are off the hook. By no means. I'm going to get into that in a minute. But I want to set the tone here because context is important. When you're going to the lens of saying a coach should be fired, when you're going to the lens of saying we have to change, 
we have to make staff changes because that doesn't just that doesn't always work out in the most positive sense, especially when you're talking about recruiting and the relationships they've built. Tom Herman has talked about alignment. Alignment was one of the first words he used when he got here in 2017. And, you know, they want to go down the Dabo Sweeney approach that they have at Clemson. And I also understand the folks on the other side that say, hey, I hear you, Steve. But sometimes if that's not the guy, you can't die with him. You got to make that switch to get some of these position groups coached up better. And and I'll, I'll break down each of these position groups. But I just wanted to start there just to set the tone with context. When I look at some of the good, obviously a lot of the good happened on the offensive side of the ball. Sam Ellinger almost having 500 yards of total offense. We were able to have get Keontae Ingram going again in the run game when he did get the opportunities. Devin DuVernay having two touchdowns, another great performance. Brennan Eagles having a bounce back game. Colin Johnson just making it through a game healthy, making some big catches on the final drive that gets us the field goal for Dick the kicker. God bless him. So there's a, there's a lot you know, we got done from offensive perspective. I thought our offensive line from a run blocking perspective was very, very good. And I liked how we started the game. I liked, I actually liked our opening script. I liked a lot of the quick game stuff. I think this staff recognized that there was some PTSD going on with some of our, our offensive line and we needed to kind of get their confidence back up. But throughout the game, even the offense and, and somebody, and you may even look at me and say, Steve, they put up 50 points. How's the offense hold any accountability and what happened in this particular game against Kansas. Well, they stalled in the middle of the game. They got off to a great start. They stalled in, really in the second and third quarter. They only put about 10 points. And then, yeah, because they came into the fourth quarter and they had 24, right? They score, I believe, on the first or second play on the fourth quarter. You're now up 34 or 31-24. The defense actually turns around and gets a stop. They force a fourth and 12. Uh, Carter Stanley throws the ball out of bounds. We get great pressure on a blitz. It's fourth and 12. Defense has gotten off the field. They punt. We fair catch Brandon Jones, I believe, inside of our 15-yard line. We have a run to Keontae Ingram on first down for a loss. And then we throw a pick. I believe that was the series where we – was easy it, it that one. Anyway, whether it was first or second down, Sam Ellinger, RPO, throws a pick. And it was very reminiscent of the pick he threw in the spring game underneath where he didn't see Jeffrey McCulloch. It's pretty much the same type of, maybe not the same type of defense or play, but very reminiscent of him throwing blind underneath. And the guy picks it off. It's 31-24, I believe. Actually, it was, it, was, it, was, it was 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter, excuse me. 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. It's 31-24, to and the offense throws an interception. And think about that. And that's why context is important. The defense now then turns around, has to come right back on the field, dejected after getting a stop. They've already played a hell of a lot of of snaps. I'll get into the snaps here in a second. They allow on first down, 16-yard touchdown run to Puka Williams uh, uh, on the ensuing play after the turnover. That's really, really tough, right? But... The defense, in my opinion, should have never been in that situation in the first place. Ball security is paramount throughout the entire football game, but most importantly, in the fourth quarter. Because if you're telling you, that's when we should have been in our four minute close the game mindset as an offense. Let's pound this football. The fact that Roshan Johnson only had 11 carries, Keontae Ingram only had 14 carries. And they were running as well as they did. That fourth quarter, we should that should have just been eat time. All right. Let's say they go down. Instead of throwing interception, the offense handles their business, goes on, say, a five, six minute drive. They're killing clock. They're getting first downs. Kind of last year Texas team where it's right. Let's say they do that and they score either a field goal or a touchdown. Now you're up two scores, whether it's uh, 34 24 or even 38 24. It's a completely different looking football game. Defense has had adequate rest. And I say all that to say this. I made, for those of you who watch my Cowboys content, I talk a lot about complimentary football. The offense did not play complimentary football with the defense in that situation. So they turn around and have to give up a quick score. But all people, we and all we do as fans, we look at the box score and say, well, they gave up 26 points in the fourth quarter. But, hey, context again. After that, Jake Smith, we catch the, the shallow cross. Protect, doesn't protect the football. Kansas puts out on the ball. Now, I thought 
from my view, K. Brewer recovered the football. Thought he had both hands on. I thought the Kansas guy only had one. I don't know what happened after they after he rolled kind of on top of him. But the officials, even after review, decide to give Kansas the football. I believe they get the football now on the 36-yard line. They go and score again, right? So these are the type of situation, two turnovers in the fourth quarter that lead to very short fields for Kansas. That's 14 points right there. And, and, and now your defense on Saturday plays 86 snaps. Just to put that in context, they only played 66 snaps against Oklahoma, and they only allowed 34 points. So before you you guys are ready to go and, and fire somebody, we have to look at also the offensive coaching staff and some of the decisions that they made, right? Some of the play calling decisions even earlier in the game. Earlier in the game, they, they, they allowed Kansas to get points on a short field. We go for it around midfield on a fourth and two. And we do the direct snap to Jake Smith, trying to force feed somebody that is maybe the fifth or sixth option you would have in that situation. That's unacceptable. And and, and we said this last week against Oklahoma. We've said this uh, Oklahoma State game. They've had some horrible decisions. And, and Tran has talked about this multiple times. By the way, Tran will be back. I'm sorry if I didn't give a preface. Tran will be back uh, later this week. We're going to do a live chat, so he'll be on to give his thoughts. Apologies about that. But going back to what I was saying, Tran talked about this. The coach is coming up, Tom Herman in particular, apologizing for, you know, being emotional or bad coaching mistakes and, and not understanding certain situations as best they should as a coaching staff. I'm done with that, all right? And that's where the coaches definitely need to be held accountable you can't have situations like that and, and allow teams to just come in here and give up plays like that, right? So the, so the Jake Smith things happened, and you did a direct snap earlier in the game to Roshan. You went to it, you went for it again later in the game. Uh, I believe that one was maybe at the beginning of the end of the third or the beginning of the fourth quarter, where they actually handed the ball off to Roshan Johnson, your hardest, biggest runner, able to turn out and get a couple yards. So those those are the type of decisions that are very concerning. And we're starting to see this these repeat happen on a weekly basis. That shit needs to stop, okay? And so going back to the defensive side of the ball, and these are some of my big picture questions here. And I want this to be addressed here in the comments. Objectively as a coaching staff, how many games this year, we've had seven games, how many games this year have our coaching staff been outcoached by the other team staff? We got to objectively ask that question. And everybody, I'm talking about position coaches. I'm talking about analysts across the board. People need to need, need to be held accountable. Ourselves as fans, Tran and I, I thought we talked a lot about Oklahoma and, and some of this. You can even attribute maybe possibly to be having an OU hangover from how we lost the game and, you know, it kind of carried over into this game. If you want to say that, sure. Did we overlook some things? Maybe the Brent Deerman situation, them moving to a new offensive coordinator who's like freaking Joe Brady Jr. over there all of a sudden. And it's the RPO master and Scott Carter. They're running a whole new offense all of a sudden at Kansas. And we have, you know, former walk-ons on the field. So I, 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 I totally get, you know, being caught off guard to some degree there. Uh, the tackling, look, bottom line to me, that's accountability that's got to be had with position coaches and players. Delhi, you know, was was a big recruit, was was a top, was an ESPN top 100 guy. He's got to make some of those tackles in the hole. I know Puka's shifty, but that first touchdown run, he can't run right through you, right? You the, the That defense was set up for you to make that stop. You don't make the play. DeMarion Obershawn, who I thought had... There's times in this game where players had really, really great moments. Overshawn was one of them. But there was also times where he just also missed a tackle and gave up a touchdown. Brandon Jones missed a tackle, giving up six, right? So you see these things happen with some of your better players, right? It's not just, you know, Byron Vaughn's, for all things considered, played great for, for what we were asking him to do. And he played a lot. 
And he was playing, he was there on that four man front trying to blow up guys. Now, I do think that there's, when I do look at the coaching, there's, there's one thing I can give to you guys that are, are not fans of Todd Orlando right now. I don't know what the hell they're telling their defensive ends to do uh, from, from a zone read perspective because all of them, nobody maintains outside integrity. They all fly in backside thinking they're going to make a tackle on a cutback or whatever. And the, every single time the quarterback's going right around the end, we don't maintain uh, outside integrity. We don't even wrong shoulder it properly, right? We, 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 and we give up outside zone consistently every single time. Our corners aren't, I don't know if they're not being taught to, to play the sideline, using the sideline as an extra defender. Things that are just, you know, nitpicky to me that, that, that seemingly aren't being addressed consistently. Those are things where I do look at coaching. Why they can't sometimes just play a simple man coverage and try to get pressure with five and, and see what happens. They don't seem to be able to do that. Todd, um, Tom Herman addressed that today and said the same thing. Why can't we do these things, right? So those are where points points where I do look at this defensive coaching staff. And I also say this to Todd Orlando and, and anybody else, whether it's Oscar Giles, because I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get to this defensive line here in a second. But even guys like Jason Washington, I understand you guys have a heavy burden with the amount of injuries that you're facing. But sometimes coaches have to take these things on as a challenge. It's like, you know what? Everyone knows what my defense looks like when everybody's perfect and healthy and all that. But sometimes as a coach, you got to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. Bottom line. You got to figure something out. Something manageable just to get your team out of the game. Now, in this case, we did get out of the game. But moving forward, you know, because we should be getting Jalen Green back for TCU, which would be a big help. But moving forward, if you're going to have to – Juwan Mitchell, I don't think that cast that he's wearing is coming off soon. You can, he, he looks like a different player right now. Delhi, you're going to have to play Delhi, and he's going to have to get better. That's your opportunity to look good as a position coach, look good as a coordinator, and get that guy coached up so where you can go back at the end of the season and say, you see where he was at Kansas? Look where he is now at Baylor. That's what I'm talking about, in-season player development. And that leads me to another point. And this is where captains like a Malcolm Roach and a Brandon Jones also come into play because these are people who are still on the field. Where is the swagger on defense? Where is the attitude? And I get, I'm, I, you know, I get Byron Bonds and and and, and David Benda. They're not going to come out there and have a whole lot of swagger. The only guy that has any t- remotely any type of swagger right now out there is Joseph Osai. Joseph Osai is the only person walking around like he's the baddest man out there. And we're going to break him because we're asking him to do every single thing. He's playing middle linebacker one play. He's on the defensive line the next play. He's running 30 yards down the field in coverage, a play after that, like he's a damn safety. And I noticed at the end of the game, his body language was totally defeated. He actually pretty much, he actually got hurt on the block field goal attempt at the end of the first half. He didn't really look like the same player after, uh, he still was making his tackles and trying to get down. But there was a play later in the game on the drive that Kansas scored to, to take the lead and go up 48 to 47. Joseph Osai makes a tackle on the sideline. And the way he got up and started walking, I'm just like, he is dead. He, he is, he is, he is dead tired, like, and hurt. He's limping. He's not even looking up. Like I felt horrible for him. I feel even worse for BJ Foster who shouldn't even be playing, but he has to because we have nobody left. Montrell Estelle's out there playing in the nickel after Brandon Jones gets hurt. Chris Adamore is out there just trying to do stuff as best he can. There's nobody left. The two-point conversion, because we had two breakdowns. Montrell Estelle looked like he got beat on the touchdown. The two-point conversion. Go back and watch that play. In the middle of the de- the defense, we're playing, a, we're playing a zone. Jawan Mitchell's playing underneath, guarding grass. B.J. Foster doesn't move. B.J. Foster's behind him, and it's a weekend at Bernie situation where we're just putting a guy out there that's a dead body just to make sure we have 11 people. It, it, it was that bad. He did not move. He can't run. He has one arm. 
that's not the B.J. Foster that we've grown accustomed to seeing, and it's not his fault they're in this situation. But he had to be out there. You guys see the guy runs the square in in the back of the end zone. B.J. Foster didn't even he, – he, I don't even know if he could turn his neck. It was literally weekend at Bernie's back there for him. So, you know, some of these but, – but I will say this. Going back to the swagger thing and, and – I, I, you know, Alex Grinch went over to OU and they changed their culture. And I do think in the off season, because this, I don't think this is something you can necessarily even fix at this point in the season. But I do think in the off season, regardless of how the season turns out, you have to have a fundamental culture shift uh, on the defensive side of the ball because they don't have the juice that they have on offense. And part of that is because Sam Ellinger is going to just will them to stuff, and that's cool. And so even when they're not on their A game in the run game or they're not on their A game in the pass game, Sam can just get them out of stuff. They don't have that on defense right now. And they have to have a culture shift as a collective unit to start playing with swagger. The Texas defenses I grew up with, the real DBUs, whether it was the Michael Huss, the Aaron Rosses, going back to Rob Babers, and Mob Brooks that's calling the game, all these guys, right? Sad Griffin, Michael Griffin, you know, they play with a certain swagger, a certain energy. Even going through the Earl Thomas days, they were very intimidating. There's nobody back there right now. As an offense, teams are coming in playing us, and they're seeing areas, they're seeing opportunity. They're like, yo, we about to get in our bag today, especially with the quarterback run game. It's inexcusable. And that's, again, that's something that has not been corrected because guys aren't even comfortable in their technique anymore of understanding and reading what's going on out there. All that, all that has to be addressed. <sighs> now, in terms of the good, we talked about, we talked a lot, a lot about the good, and, and, and this is something that we'll continue to, to also chat about on the live because I'm trying to figure out what are some solutions, how do we get through this. Right now, TCU, going to this, this, this TCU game, they, they open as a two-and-a-half-point favorite, which I think – Opened a lot of people's eyes, considering they only have three wins. Uh, folks are looking at this like, are we going to lose to Baylor? Are we going to lose to Iowa State? Look, I made a comment, and I have to be held accountable as well. I said, hey, I, I felt like there's a gap between OU and us, and then there was a gap between us and the rest of Big 12. Screw all that. Every week is all hands on deck, Matthew. You hear me? Every single week, we are on high alert. There's no more looking ahead to anybody. I don't I don't care what Baylor's doing until we get there. Because we might lose two, two or three games before that. I don't know how many games between Baylor. The point is we have five games left. All five games are are, are all hands on deck. There's no more there's no more eh, it's Kansas we can skate by. Because I did that and I was wrong. And I have to be held accountable as a fan because Part of the reason why we're all feeling down is because of expectations. Going back to my movie analogy, right, that I had made a few videos ago. All those types of things factor into how we got here collectively, even as a fan base. So moving forward, this TCU game, I'm not style pointing victories anymore. I just want to win. I just want to win. And hopefully over the course of trying to string together some wins, string together some momentum, we can get some people back, look more like how we looked towards the beginning of the season, and then potentially earn or earn the right to get back to Arlington and play in the Big 12 title game with actual healthy, able bodies. But right now, you know, the concern and the focus has to be on how do we get out of Fort Worth with a W? Bottom line. No more, no more, We, you know, I want to see this person get... Look, we, we, we spent so much time talking about uh, Keontae versus Roshan, and all I've ever said was, we need both. We need both, and look, as a coaching staff, that's where you're paying attention, and you say, all right, Roshan's hot right now, we're going to ride Roshan. Hey, Keontae's hot right now, we're going to ride Keontae. Why is that? Because certain running styles work differently against certain teams. Sometimes it's just matchup stuff. Sometimes that player's skill set will just thrive better against – how that defense is attacking us. But we have to we need both of them. We we need Jordan Winnington when he gets back here. We're starting to see some some serious chinks in the armor with the offensive line. And we're not getting to people's quarterbacks the way they're getting to ours. 
All right. So all those things we have to just get better at. But at the same token, we still have everything in front of us to play for. We still, the people that say, hey, we Steve, we lost two games to the two top five teams. That is true. And that should be our mindset moving forward. We're still one of the better teams. We had a bad week with a mash unit. Let's try to start getting some able bodies back. Whatever we have to do to address these angles and these 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 issues that we consistently see with maintaining outside contain, we need to address it. But I'm not here yet as a fan to say this coach, this coach, this coach needs to be fired. Now, does Tom Herman, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave this part here, does Tom Herman have to take a look at somebody he looks at almost like a brother in a Todd Orlando and try to remove emotion and, and their past relationship on evaluating his performance of his crew and maybe overseeing that a little bit more? Do we need to potentially bring in some more analysts? You know, because Les Miles didn't, he didn't give a shit about that other guy he fired. He fired that guy in a second and just got this young guy in here and bingo, right? So, Tom, I, you know, these are things that Tom's going to have to figure out. And Tom's going to have to have those hard conversations, if he hasn't already, with Todd. Period. And, and this defensive line, that's what I'm saying. There's a difference between reasons and excuses. The linebackers are reasons. The defensive line, you guys are not part of that as an excuse because y'all are healthy. I see Keandre Coburn out there. Malcolm Roach came back after the suspension. Taquan Graham was out there. Tavondre Sweat was out there. Moro Joma was out there. I, 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 Marquez Bimage was out there. Everybody was out there. Chisholm. I saw every single guy on our defensive line play. My issue is that the only person I see mo- making any type of disturbance in the backfield on a consistent basis is Coburn. I'm just being real. The defensive line has started to let me down. And that's, again, going back to my points about complimentary football. I try to keep it simple. When other people are struggling, the, the, the one group that is healthy needs to step the hell up. That's when the defensive line says, you know what, linebackers, we've got y'all. Linebackers, we're going to help y'all see you. Linebackers, we're going to try to make this play in the backfield. I'm going to try to beat my man. Whatever. When's the last time Taquan Graham did anything? What's he doing? I see him out there. I see him engaging in blocks. I see him getting occasional stalemates. I don't see him getting TFLs. And I'm just, I'm, again, I'm just trying to keep it a buck right now. I don't see enough to Vondre Sweat because at least with him, I was seeing him cause piles and blowing shit up. I see more Ojama out there. He consistent, consistently misreads what's going on when he's the unblocked man and he runs inside every single time and falls for the cheese. Is that coaching? Is that Oscar Giles? These are questions that I I, I, I need answers to. Um, and, and we can talk more about it on the live chat. But the defensive line has been very underwhelming the last couple weeks. And and I, I need better from, from the group that is healthy. Because it's not even like a Brandon Jones situation where we're asking him to play a position that is not even his position. Like, we're asking Brandon Jones to play nickel. And God bless him. He's out there running around as much as he can. It's not in his skill set. And he's struggling with a very good slot receiver in Robinson, right, and, and getting cooked. And then we ask, and then he gets hurt, and we ask Estelle to do the same thing. So that, I mean, versus defensive line, it's just like, can I get a little bit uptick on the pressure? Can y'all get home with, with your group, and maybe we can allocate more resources on the back end? So those are some things, conversations, that need to be had with this group. Now quickly moving on to TCU and getting into some some prep there. TCU's 3-3 three and three coming into this. They just lost in Manhattan to Kansas State in the most Kansas State-ish way <laughs> with the block uh, punt and, 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 you know, Kansas State dominating the football time possession-wise. Uh, TCU's obviously had, you know, kind of the juggling thing going on, Gary Patterson, the quarterback situation. But the reason, one of the reasons why they're favored is, you know, we've what we're giving up in the run game right now is very scary when you're talking about Facing Darius Anderson and and, Se- and Sewu, right? So both those brothers can can get out. And then on top of that, Max Duggan 
Showed a lot in the quarterback run game last week. He had a crazy-ass uh, 50-yard touchdown in the Kansas State game. We, we've seen what Alex Delton can do and how he can hurt us in the past. So uh, those things, and then being back at home, and we haven't beaten TCU, I believe, since uh, – Matthew, you can fact-check me out. I think it's 2013 since we've beaten TCU uh, in Fort Worth. So those are some things right now that are a little bit up against us. But we're underdogs. If we can play that card this week. We can go in and say, look, we're, on, we're now we're on a redemption tour. We're 1-0 and in our redemption tour from, from trying to get back to the Big 12 championship game. But we didn't look good. Let's go out. Let's play good football. Let's try to out-coach the other team's staff. Help the kids out a little bit, guys. It's not the end of the world, but I need to see a better job. And I'm going to ask the question again for those who forgot. In the seven games that Texas has had this year, how many times have we out-coached the opponent? Versus the opponent, versus us saying, we got out coached. I would love to know people's thoughts in the comments. I'm going to poll this maybe on Instagram or something just to see what people's thoughts are. But, uh, you know, as I, as I look at TCU, though, you know, our good friend Shane Bouchel, uh, you know, they had, a, they had a great showing against the TCU defense. That TCU defense is not the same, you know, vaunted 425 look that we've seen from Gary Patterson of old, but if anybody can get their team ready, you know, on a quick turnaround, you know, Kansas had two weeks to prepare. You saw the, you know, the wrinkles they added in for us. We'll see what TCU has in store uh, for us and how we adjust. I think getting Jalen Green back will be huge, right? Especially going against a guy like a Jalen, Jalen Rager. Uh, how do you play that? You know, some people side with put your best corner on the best wide receiver and you figure out everything else or, you put your second best corner on Jalen Rager, and then you double. I'm sorry. Put your second best corner on the other guy, and you double up Jalen Rager on coverage. Curious now, nah, people would approach that, but they do line him up all over the place, very similar to what we saw with C.D. Lamb. I expect TCU this week to install a lot of that stuff that they do with C.D. Lamb, uh, whether it's motioning uh, Jalen Rager in the backfield. We've seen them do this with him in the past. And then on top of that, how do they mix in some of their RPO zone read stuff with Anderson and Oweyu? So that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. But uh, I did see enough from what we saw uh, Shane Bouchelle have success with against them, uh, what we saw even Skylar Thompson and his quarterback run game. Sam Ellinger should have a bowl of opportunities to move the football and have a pretty good day. I think this is actually going to be a good game for the offensive line. Now, the, the thing I am concerned with is some of the gains and the stunts that I know TC will throw at us because we've been struggling with that. And, it's, and it kind of started in the West Virginia game. So we're going to have to clean up a lot of that stuff. Um, and, and as I continue to do more film study on TCU throughout the week, we'll discuss more um, on the live chat. Live chat's either going to be Wednesday or Thursday, but I'll post on all social media uh, when we will be having that conversation. So please get questions ready and, and we'll dive into all that information. Uh, make sure also links below, you're subscribed on social media, all the accounts, uh, a lot of good stuff going on there that you may not necessarily see here on YouTube. But overall, guys, I mean, uh, this was a, also a personal event session for me. Um, an event in terms of Everything is never as bad as it seems or as good as it seems. It's normally somewhere in the middle. Um, and I don't think it's time for us to turn on this team by any means, nor would I ever. But I, I, I think I think some of us are being a little, little too critical and just saying, well, the defense sucks without adding in any type of context. If you're going to ask this defense to play 86 snaps a game, with the limited personnel they have, that's what you're going to get. There's other ways you can help people out. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Blake, uh, who's been messaging me on Facebook and sending in questions. And uh, he actually brought up a good point about punt return. We're last in the country. I don't know if any of you have seen this statistic. Out of 130 schools, we're 130 in punt return. We're actually the only school, Matthew, fun fact, we're the only school in the FBS that has negative yards for return. Everybody else has positive. So do with that information what you will. I think 
if there's any if there's any change that needs to be made, you need we need to get a special teams coordinator in here pronto, like a real one, okay? Because we beat we beat Charlie Strong over the head about the bad special teams. The one thing that Tom's figured out is we have a good kicker. You know, he we did we got that addressed, but our return units are trash, just absolute trash across the board. All right, and I don't even think it's on the the returner per se, but we don't we don't seem to block it very well. We don't seem to to have anything, nor do we have any type. We don't have any sense of urgency in regards to field position. Period. We don't go after kicks. Now, part of punt return is also forcing said punt. So I guess you could bend some of that back on the defense if you want. But uh, these are just some things that wanted to kind of put out there in air. But overall, um, you know, Sam Ellinger now with 26 touchdowns, he's he's having a historic season statistically. Uh, and, and but But at the same token, he also has to get up in front of that team and say, guys, I cannot turn the football over in the fourth quarter. Guys, I have to protect y'all better. You know, uh, offensive line has to step up and say we can do a better job of protecting QB one. Because God forbid he goes down, everything else is just going to go to shit anyway, right? Uh, running backs, keep doing what you're doing. Wide receivers, make plays, help the quarterback. Like everybody, there's room for everybody to step up, even the guys that are playing well, right? So all these things, again, my only ask to everybody as fans context just remember that guys thanks again to boss's ranch appreciate y'all sponsoring us as always very thankful for everything we've uh been able to get out to y'all and we'll be back later this week for the live chat still got the dub i think we're gonna be okay versus tcu we'll give predictions on the live chat horns always up